Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. Thank you. You may be seated. A number of years ago, when I was just a young man, I had to walk to school, and it was quite a distance. We lived in Birmingham, Alabama, which was really... Birmingham is like a valley and is surrounded by mountains. And we lived on the very outskirts of uh, that of Birmingham. And uh, so to get to school, I had to walk way down into what we called a holler in Alabama. And uh, then from that holler, I would walk up the steepest mountain in the area and then down to a little plateau, and then down to a little plateau. Then my school was in a valley. And so uh, my whole life, my parents being pastors and in ministry had been taken up with God and with church things. It was the highlight of our life. We went to church literally every night somewhere because we had revivals back then. That's what they called them. And we had like in our organization maybe six or eight churches in the region where we were. Some of them were always in a revival. So we went every night. So it was our life. So I would walk to school and I would talk to God. Just a little guy, but I would talk to God. And one day I had walked up to the first plateau, coming home up the second flat plateau, and then finally up that big old mountain and got on top and I would always stop and rest up there because I'd be so tired. And I was talking to God, and that day, God spoke back to me. First time I ever heard his voice, it wasn't audible. It rose up in my spirit, and a communion started with God as just a small young man. And that communion that started with God, God speaking to me, would be the guiding light of my life. I had dreams, repetitive dreams, re that recurring dreams when I was a child, and I was always standing in the middle of a valley surrounded by mountains, and I was always, as a little guy, preaching. I was just preaching up a storm. And then the mountains would turn into people, tens of thousands of people. And... Uh, my wife and I, on one of our first big outings, spoke in an arena that was completely circular. And there were 10,000 people in that arena when we sang and when we spoke. And the Lord showed me the fulfillment of, of that. Then in 1986, uh, I had married the, uh, the most beautiful and most wonderful person that had ever come into my life. And we were young and just starting out um, a few years prior to that. In 86, we had already kind of been banished from our organization because I was preaching things out of this book that, weren't in, that wasn't in their book. And so this book made them uncomfortable because it wasn't like their book. And so we kind of got disfellowshipped, if you know what I mean. And so we wound up coming to this metropolis called Florida. Isn't it wonderful? I just wish they had shut up about it. DeSantis just talks too much. You know, they're coming from everywhere. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I won't even be able to get out of my drive soon. <laughs> well, uh, well, where was I now? <laughs> so we uh, moved to this beautiful metropolis, Florida, and the only thing we knew how to do is preach and sing. That's just what we knew how to do. So we took a job at the uh, Altamont Racket Club uh, playing music. We were the highest paid duo at that time in Central Florida. And we did, uh, we played in a lobby slash bar 
slash big pool area, and we did top 40 music. And uh, in that lobby and doing what we did, singing, it just came natural to us. It was something we felt comfortable doing. We didn't feel we were demonic or anything like that. You know, so, but we wanted to start the church so bad. Of course, that's what the whole movie is about. And so I decided to fast for a week. So I went on a seven-day fast, and they were having, uh, they had these conventions at the racket club, and they had a religious conference there, and Janice and I knew a lot of the people in that conference, and going to back to the conference rooms and area, they would pass through the lobby and where we were playing music, but it just seemed very hard for any of them to really acknowledge us. And believe me, I'm not a victim and I don't have a victim mentality. We're kingdom people. We don't have a victim mentality. And, but I thought, I thought, well, they know me and I know them and I'm trying to look and smile at them as they go by, but it's almost like they couldn't even let their head look over there a little bit. We, just, we need to be careful not to get religious in life. You know, religion's an ugly thing. Relationship's a beautiful thing, but religion is an ugly thing. It's got an ugly head on it. I'm telling you. But there we were, fasting for seven days. Uh, and then after that, we went to lunch with a couple that we love very much. And she was in charge of a big railroad, hiring and firing of everybody that worked for the whole railroad. And I told her, I was telling them, I'm getting ready, you know, we play from 6 to 10 every night, and I'm five nights a week, and so I'm getting ready to uh, take a day job to pay off some bills. And so she jokingly said, well, I tell you what, I'll give you a job on the railroad and put you out on grade. It's about 120 degrees out there every day. If you want a job, you can have it. And I said, I'll start tomorrow. And she got a funny look on her face and said, you wouldn't last a day out there in that kind of heat at your age. You know, 38's kind of old for the NFL, and uh, 38 was kind of old for the railroad, but you know what? When God is with you, you can last a day, you can last a week, a month, a year, you can last as long as you need to last. <clears throat> I was out there just long enough for that scene to take place at lunch, reading my Bible on the lunch break, and God says to me, lift up your head. Everything you see before you, I've given to you in your seed forever. Boss, where are we? St. Cloud. I knew the mantle that God had placed on me and my family at that point. I had a, I had a location. Never had a location before. I knew my traveling days were over because I finally had a location. And so that's when we showed up here. And... Uh, two days or three days after that, I was in a uh, chase lounge out by the pool where we lived. We lived in some apartments. And God gave me an open vision. Well, actually, we were in a condo, weren't we? And we, the pool was a kind of a general area. So. so I was laying in this chase lounge, and God gave me this open vision and showed me a building. And the building was a little white building on one acre. It looked like a little bitty piece of land, actually one acre. That's what it was when we bought. It was that building. And so we actually, over the weekend, got in the car, Janice and I, and went driving looking for that building. We spent hours and hours both days just driving and looking for that building because I'd never had anything like that happen to me before. And so... St. Cloud was where we were, so we were driving in St. Cloud, so miraculously, boom, there is that little building. And we had an opportunity to purchase that little building or to be able to get into that little building to start advancing this dream we had of building a church. Now, when we started this church, Janice and I formulated what we would use as a tagline on everything that would ever be printed. Anything that would ever be printed would have this tagline on it. And this was the tagline. The kingdom of God is a non-judgmental society that ministers dignity and esteem to all people. It was on everything we printed. It was on everything we did. 
Everything that had to do with this church, it was there. And the first message that I taught, series that I taught from that building over there, was the title of my teaching today. I have two books, fasten your seatbelt. One's all brand new stuff, and one is a few ideas from that first Sunday over there that I'm going to share with you on the transcendent kingdom. In the eternity of eternities, God ruled from his throne in the kingdom of heaven. In Genesis 1 and 1, God said, the word says, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. What exactly does that mean? God, the Father, said to the Trinity, let us expand the kingdom of heaven by colonizing a new heaven and a new earth. In other words, God said, the kingdom of heaven, that's where God lived. God lived in heaven and he established his kingdom in heaven. Therefore, it was the kingdom of heaven. But God says to the Trinity, the Father, let's expand the kingdom of heaven and let's colonize a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis 1, verse 2b, he said, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And when that happened, if you continue to follow this text, it separated the waters and the firmament of heaven was created and it separated it from the dry ground and the earth was created. In Genesis 1.10, and God called the dry land earth. And then he said this, after telling the Trinity, we'll create a new heaven, a new earth, we'll expand our kingdom, we'll colonize it. And he said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So God decides not only to create a new heaven and a new earth. See, he's in the kingdom of heaven. But let's go down here and create a brand new heaven and create a new earth. Let's colonize it and make man in our image and in our likeness. And let's give him dominion over the new heaven and over the new earth. So let's colonize this new planet by replicating ourselves to rule over our expanded domain. So this is what man was created for in Genesis 1, 26b. And let's go a step farther and give him dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all of the earth. So what does dominion mean? It means authority and lordship and kingship and rulership. That's why the Bible in Revelation said that we're kings and priests. And to replicate means that we are recreated and replicated after our Father to be able to reign and rule in the kingdom of God on this earth. Now how many of you know that Adam and Eve, these two people, they're freshly from the hand of God. He had just taken the dirt and the clay of the earth and formed them and created them freshly from the hand of God. And God starts talking to them about all of these things that they're going to have dominion over. You're going to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle. And finally he reached a point. He just said, all the earth, everything. I am giving you dominion over it all. I'm giving you that authority, that lordship, that kingship, that rulership, and I have replicated myself in you. We have replicated ourselves in you, and you are our children, and you will rule in this new domain. So here are these two people, fresh from the hands of God. They're on this brand new planet, new heaven, new earth, brand new planet. This thing is speeding through space. And then God looked at both of them and said, take dominion over it and drop the mic. How would that make you feel? He had spent so much time just enumerating every principle of the kingdom. Enumerating principle after principle after principle after principle. Then he began to talk about dominion. Here's what I've given you dominion over this and this and this and this. And all the entire planet. And then the last thing he said is, take dominion over it. 
And in that garden where he put them, there was a fountainhead that produced a beautiful flowing river in the garden. And when he got to the parameter of the garden, the Bible said it divided into four rivers. Sounds like a good name for a barbecue place, doesn't it? Come on down here, get a little of this sauce on your mouth here. It's good stuff. And these four rivers, and they went, you know, kind of like north, south, east, west, that, that type thing. And, and if you study history, all of the major civilizations of the world sprang up around those four rivers. Babylon, the, Babylon the Great, one of the greatest empires to ever be built right there on the Tigris River. Iraq today, right there on the Tigris River. And, and just a 40 miles going in the other direction is the Euphrates going off in, a, in another direction. But it all, it all culminated right there with that fountainhead, that one river flowing out of the garden and dividing into four. I believe these four rivers were to be God's transportational system to take the generational descendants of Adam and Eve to the four corners of the earth so that the new planet he had created could be colonized with people that would replicate who he is. Genesis 2 and 16 said, And of all the trees that are in the garden, God tells Adam and Eve, you can freely eat of them. But there is a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. And the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so what he said to them was that knowledge belongs to me. Knowledge is not yours. You're not meant to live by knowledge. You're meant to live by revelation. I am knowledge and I take my knowledge and it, I give it to you in the form of revelation and I reveal my will to you and show you how to live the kingdom life. And so God took of his knowledge to give to Adam and Eve in the form of revelation. But Satan was in the garden. There was a, another king there was a, another kingdom. And this other king stuck his head up and said to Eve, did God, did I hear that right? Did God say? Well, yes, he did say. He said, the day that we partake of the knowledge of God, we would surely die. He said, thou shalt not surely die. God knows the moment that you partake of his knowledge, you'll have the knowledge of right and wrong, the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge to establish belief systems and values and moral absolutes, and, and you'll no longer be subservient to God, but you'll become a God. And instantly, Adam and Eve circumvented God and reached around God to seize Godhood for themselves. And they partook of the knowledge that belonged to God, not to man. And after partaking of that knowledge, everything God told them would happen, did happen. Physical death came upon man. Spiritual death. What is spiritual death? It's the departure of the Spirit of God. It's a departure of the nature of God, which is a God-pleasing nature. It left man, leaving a void in the heart, the soul, and the spirit of man. And that old Satan himself, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience saw an opportunity to move in and fill that void in the heart, the soul, the spirit of man. And he moved in and filled man with himself and with his nature, which was a God-opposing nature, not a God-pleasing nature. So what happened in the garden? Something terrible happened. What was it? So as Adam and Eve sought to foundationalize the kingdom of God, another king and another kingdom popped its head up. An opposing kingdom. It emerged immediately. And here is where the doctrine and philosophy of pragmatism was born, was born in the heart of Satan and was then shared 
with those two people who were freshly out of the hands of God. It was developed by C.S. Pierce and William James and given to mankind, but it came out of the heart of Satan himself. And see, pragmatism is this. It is the method of determining the meaning and the truth of all concepts and testing their validity based on their practical results. In other words, pragmatism only asks one question. Does it work? If it works, it's true. If it works, it's valid. If it does not work, it is not true. And if it does not work, it is not valid. That's as deep as pragmatism goes. Pragmatism allows judgments to be made on a subjective basis. Does it draw a crowd? Does it produce a harvest? Does it make me happy? Does it bring me prestige? Does it give me the things that I want? Does it make me feel good? Does it make me grow? Does it make me feel blessed? Pragmatism goes no deeper than the result. And so Satan, this new king and new kingdom, says, did God say? You want to know what he really said? Does that make you happy? How do you feel about that? Does, does, does that give you prestige? Do you think that's going to get the result that you ultimately want in your life? Does that make you feel good? Do you think that'll make you grow? Does that bless you? They immediately answered the question by circumventing God, reaching around God to seize Godhood for themselves. Children of the kingdom of God must never live by pragmatism. We must never live by what feels good, what works, what looks good, what seems to get results. We live not by pragmatism, but you and I live by principle. The kingdom of God is about a principle to life. And all the principles have been established by the king of the kingdom. And he decides how we're to live. And our job is to simply obey him and be obedient to him and not worry about how we feel about it. I figured out a long time ago that God is not too concerned about how I feel about anything. You see, it's not a matter of what works for me. It's not a matter of what feels good to me or what makes me happy. It's a matter of what is right. And that's why you have so many people today moving around from church to church, going here, going there, going over here. COVID hits and 40%, 50% of the people nationwide go away. You know, there's something wrong there. Something going on there. Something has been down in there. Well, I don't know if I really felt good about it. I don't know if I was really happy. I don't know if I was really being fed. But won't you eat? If you eat a little bit, you'll be fed. God didn't call me to spoon feed people for the rest of their lives. He called me to throw some stuff out and give guidance. But they got to grow. Sheep have to put their head down and they have to eat. How do you feel? Satan said. Does that feel good to you? I'll try to say this in a very sweet way, but I'll have to use an old phrase, forgive me if it's not politically correct. Church hoppers, they just hop from church to church. They're pragmatists. They're, they're the original pragmatist of Christianity. And you know why? Because they're always in search of something that makes me feel good, that makes me happy, that I think is right. You see, an opposing kingdom and an opposing king introduced a strategy that is still with us today. It's never gone away. He's still saying, do you agree with... The way that pastor said that, how does that make you feel? Are you happy about that? I mean, does that, do you feel good about that? 
See, what has happened in Christianity because pragmatism has invaded Christianity is judgments are made on a truly subjective basis. And here's the subjective base. Does it draw a crowd? Does it pay off? Does it make me happy? Does it bring me prestige? Does it give me the things I want? Does it make me feel good? Does it make me grow? Does it bless me? Here's the subtility of what Satan introduced in the garden. All of these things are evidenced even today in Christianity because they've infiltrated the church. The difference in pragmatism looks no deeper than the result. And that's where it stops. It doesn't go any deeper than that. If it doesn't make me feel good, then it doesn't validate what I need in my life. So I'm going to have to keep seeking till I find somewhere and someplace that validates me, makes me feel good, makes me happy. You know, the Bible said that God set every one of us in the body as it pleases. Who? Him. Him. He didn't set us in the body thinking that it would please us. You know, it's like going and buying a new suit. Do you ever go buy a new suit and they hang this suit on you and his arms are too long? It's all baggy in here. It's, it doesn't fit right on your shoulders and everything. And then they go to work on it. Now, if God sets you in the body as it pleases him, here's my belief. God throws this big old suit on you that looks terrible. Well, this don't make me happy. This don't make me feel good. This don't show the beauty of who I am. And then God starts to alter that suit to tailor make it to fit where he's trying to take you. If you went to a church, my friend, and a suit was put on you that was just sculpted to your body, where are you going to go from there? You believe everything they believe, everything they say makes you happy, everything they say makes you feel good, everything that goes on just tickles your fancy real good. Where are you going to go from there? There's no place to go from there. God set us in the body as it pleases him. God takes us and hangs a big old suit of clothes on us and says, by the time it's over, I'm going to sculpt that to fit you like nothing can fit you because you can only wear that to go where you're going. In John 6 and 60, Jesus told his disciples that were following him. He wasn't talking to sinners. These were his disciples. You have to eat my body and you have to drink my blood. And if you you know anything about Judaism, that's one of the worst things in the world because they had, they had teachings after teachings about you know, the blood and what's clean and unclean and all that. And the Bible said they became very upset And Jesus being as tender as he was, you know, he never worried about, uh, he just always was concerned not to offend people or hurt people, kind of like in the temple when he was turning over the tables and took the whip that he made and was running them out of the temple. He looked at all of them and he said, doth this offend you? What do you mean? This, This don't make you feel happy? You don't feel prestige about this? You don't feel good about this? You don't feel blessed about this? This offend you? This is one of the saddest verses in that chapter. It said, And many of his disciples from that point on left him and followed him no more. You know why? Because it didn't make them feel good. It didn't get the result they were looking for. It's about me, me, me. It's about I, me, and mine. It's about how I feel about the pastor, how I feel about the elders, how I feel about the church, how I feel about all these teachings, how I feel about everything because it's not a perfect sculpted suit that fits me. And they went away and they followed him no more. Here's my contention that if Jesus couldn't keep his members And many of them went away and followed him no more. Can you imagine from the day that we walked in here that if 
Everybody that ever came to this church when we were pastors at the back door, I'd stand there and shake hands. They would always tell me, oh, oh, pastor, oh, God, greatest music I ever heard in my life. Never heard a teaching like that in my whole life. Oh, well, we're home. We're home. We're, yeah, we're here forever. This is where we're going to raise our family. Three months later, you couldn't find them anywhere. If you saw them, at, if you saw them down here at Fat Boys, then you might see them, but otherwise you're not going to see them anywhere. Can you imagine if it weren't for pragmatism and the groups, can you imagine if this group here, we didn't have a bunch of pragmatists, which every church has. If we didn't have any pragmatists in this group and we started building on this, in two years, you wouldn't be able to have enough services to work with this building. You'd have to be, you'd have to do. But Satan's ultimate weapon of pragmatism keeps churches with a big revolving door in the front and the back because everybody's running from place to place. Does it make me feel good? Does it work for me? Do I like the way it sounded? Preach on, Brother Gary. Don't want it to get quiet in here now. Okay, are you with me? We kingdom people judge by a philosophy of principle. Kingdom life is a principle to life. And we live not by prag pragmatism, not by what feels good, looks good, seems to work, or gets, re gets result, but we live by what is right. And that's the only thing we live by. So many people today in the kingdom of God are pragmatist. And they're unfulfilled. They're not even happy drifting from church to church. They're, just, they're only one message away from leaving that one and going somewhere else. Because they're not happy. They're building their lives on a false philosophy instead of a principle to life. They're living their life on the pragmatist life. Oh, did God say? Oh, did that make you feel good? Oh, how do you feel about that? Oh, does that fit your view of things? And so what do they keep doing? They just keep rotating. People talk, I hear pastors talk about my church. Good. No, it didn't. They didn't run it. You hadn't... You hadn't brought anybody new into the kingdom of God. You just got a bunch of rejects from that church and that one and that one and that one. And they won't be with you long. Have fun. It's a false premise. If you go deep, deep enough, you'll find it's not any of the things they put their finger on and say this was the reason. If you go deep enough, you'll find really it's all about them. It's all about me. The only validation of the spirit that a pragmatist ever has is a false foundation. It's, it's built on a false foundation. How does it make me feel? That's the only validation of the spirit a pragmatist ever ha has. How does it make me feel? If it makes me feel good, it's true and it's valid. If it doesn't make me feel good, it's not true and not valid. Therefore, I have to get away from it. Everybody okay? So it's not a matter of what's right and wrong with them. It's a matter of how does it make me feel. Now finally and lastly, I want to hit this. When I was in, uh, when I was in school, I had a teacher in the fifth grade. Her name was Miss McDonald. And she taught us about the different kingdoms of the world, and I loved it so much. She loved me. I don't know why I was uh, red-headed, freckle-faced, and mean. But Miss McDonald loved me. I don't, I don't know why. She'd let me go get stuff for her and do things. I think she felt sorry for me or something. I don't know. But anyway, she taught us about the mineral kingdom. And then a little more complex kingdoms called the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the kingdom of man. And so in these teachings, the mineral kingdom was dirt and elements and material. These were the things in the lowest form. And there was no way that elements and minerals and dirt could put themselves by their own power into a higher kingdom. They were in the mineral kingdom and that's where they had to stay. They could not become a flower no matter how bad the dirt, the elements and the minerals wanted to become a beautiful flower, they could not become a flower. But if a seed from a higher kingdom, the plant kingdom, 
If a seed were to come down to this lowly kingdom, the mineral kingdom, and plant itself in that dirt, in those minerals, in those elements, that seed, the life power of God locked in that seed would burst open and then what it would do is it would suck all the dirt, the minerals, and the elements up into a higher kingdom because it had no power the mineral kingdom to promote itself, it had to be acted upon from above and sucked up into another kingdom. And no matter how bad that plant, that beautiful, when it bloomed, it was a beautiful rose and a beautiful plant, no matter how bad it wanted to be in the animal kingdom, it could not promote itself. It couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. it had to be acted upon from above. So here comes Mr. Cow. And he sees these beautiful plants and greenery and flowers and he eats them. So you got the dirt, the elements and the mineral that were pulled up into the seed and into the plant kingdom that produced the rose and the flower. The cow eats the flower. Now all of both of those kingdoms are sucked up and pulled up into this higher kingdom. Then man and the kingdom of man comes along and says, I feel like a T-bone steak today and a glass of milk. And so the cow is pulled up into the higher kingdom. It couldn't promote itself and become a man, but it was pulled up into the higher kingdom. And in this higher kingdom of man, he begins to live out and walk out all of the kingdoms that were beneath him. And they're all pulled up. The plant kingdom pulled up the mineral kingdom the animal kingdom pulled up the plant kingdom. The kingdom of man pulled up the animal kingdom. And now here stands man. Are you with me? Whew. So John 15 and 16, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. No matter how bad, and you're, you're here in the kingdom of man and the kingdoms of this world, all these other kingdoms have been pulled up into this. And no matter how bad you want to be in a higher kingdom, you can't promote yourself. You can't promote yourself. But one day Jesus comes along by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He looks at you. And the Spirit does seven things. You feel conviction, godly sorrow. You repent. You're forgiven. You're you're given, uh, uh, you, you, you're given, let's see here, you, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, you feel godly sorrow, uh, conviction, godly sorrow, you repent, you're forgiven, redemption, or you're, you're forgiven, you're redeemed. And then you're justified. Uh, then you get salvation. Then you're justified. Boom, 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 boom. Seven things. I just can't think of them very quickly. <laughs> but I know what they are. And so what happens, you're acted upon from above by the Holy Spirit. You couldn't promote yourself into a higher kingdom, but you're acted upon from above. Think Think about Adam and Eve. They're standing here. God says, he tells them all this stuff, drops the mic, says, you've got dominion over it all. Here all of a sudden you're acted upon by the Holy Spirit. You're pulled up into a new kingdom and a new life. And uh, Revelation 21 says, behold, I make all things new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So here Janice and I were, we were born again, brand new. God gives us a brand new earth to live on. Everything's new. He gives us a brand new heaven, a kingdom we never even knew was there. I mean, here it is. Everything's brand new. We had no knowledge of it, no knowledge of the Spirit, no knowledge of God. We had no knowledge of the things of the earth. He didn't talk to us like he did in the garden to Adam and Eve. He just gave us this book when we got converted and says, here's all my principles, here's all my teachings, everything. So here, me and Janice, we've been born again. Everything's new. It's a new heaven and a new earth. We've been acted upon from above. And you know what God said? God says, I'm going to bring you 
from glory to glory to glory to glory by my spirit. You can't do it. You can't promote yourself. You can't act upon yourself. But I'm going to continue to act upon you by the power of the Holy Spirit and draw you up and raise you up and lift you up from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory until someday your feet stand on streets of gold and you're with me eternally. And I decided a long time ago, I want to do it his way, not my way. Uh, sit down one second. Uh, on Founders Day, I, I wanted to take this, this chance. First of all, that is literally one of the best messages I've ever heard in my entire life. The concept, I asked him in the back, I, I said, where did you, where in the world did you get that thing about the kingdom? He's like, I just wrote it in my book yesterday. Yeah. So like, th this is just I insane, it's incredible. I wanted to take a second and ask you something. We don't get this opportunity too often, but for people that are here today, when you came out of the organization that you were in originally, it was like being pulled up out of that dirt yes. because the mentality that you grew up in, there were some really sweet people who genuinely loved God, yes. but you were stuck with a lot of uh, thinking that was uh, very limiting to the, the kinds of things that you want to do in your heart. Um, what do you credit in those early days other than purely the grace of God what do, you, what do you credit you being able to come up out of that kind of soil thing to, to, to God moving you to another level? Was there a, was there a preacher or, a, or a, someone that you heard or something that, that kind of helped you get from, from one level to another? Because what, even the whole phrase, the statement, you know, that the kingdom of God is a non-judgmental society that ministers dignity and esteem to all people, that was not, I know... I know the mottos and the phrases from where we came out of. There was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So how did you, how, what was it like in, in those early stages with you and mom of like, you know, you see those uh, like, you know, on, on National Geographic, like the, the, when the horse is born or the giraffe, their legs are wobbling. You sort of were, were, were talking about that in your life, mm -hmm. kingdom-wise, when you were getting your feet under you and you're figuring out how to do that. What, is there something that you credit? Because I think there are people here today that, are in that soil part of, of, of their life and something from above, a seed is being planted today through this word. And as they're growing in their faith, they may not have a lot of people to look to that are examples of what is in their heart in the same way you were. But what do you credit that early time to? Having been addicted to drugs as I was, I was a mess when I came to God. And for the first year, my precious little wife, she prayed, for me constantly. I dedicated that year as she and I began to travel and do ministry. We were just really given our testimony. I was not qualified to do anything else. We were traveling from church to church giving our testimony. And it just like a fire rose up in me. I would find myself expanding on the testimony and teaching and bringing scriptures to bear but we did a revival and and I would pray and study the word all day long every day and uh, we did a revival in a little town up in Tennessee the pastor one day said I want to take you to the Christian bookstore I want to buy you a book and he took me to a Christian bookstore and he bought me a three volume set on the kingdom of God. And in the organization I came out of, I didn't even know there was a kingdom. Mm. See, the kingdom is absolute. Wow. The church is relative. Mm. In other words, the church has no purpose without the kingdom. Wow. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Wow. The church is the carrier of the kingdom message. So without the kingdom, the church has no purpose. I didn't know that. 
Because even from the Roman Catholic Church who made the church infallible, the Pope infallible, everything, they turned the kingdom and everything and made the church the kingdom. Most churches, even Protestant, believe the church is the kingdom. It gets a little footnote. When Jesus comes, he'll set up his kingdom. No. Jesus talked over a hundred times about the kingdom. Mm. Twice he mentioned the church. Only once did he ever mention being born again. Wow. And it wasn't for the purpose of talking about being born again. He said, except, he said, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Right. It was all about the kingdom. It wasn't about it being born again. Wow. It's that being born again is the way to the kingdom. It's the way to see and be illuminated, have understanding. And so I devoured that three-volume set on the kingdom. And I developed an appetite to put God's word in my spirit. My wife does the same thing. We've always done it. And we tried to fill our spirit so that when the sheep, when you approached us, we never told you what we thought or what we felt or what we believed. We always answered you with the word. The world doesn't need to hear what I have to say. The world needs to hear what he says. That's incredible. So you answered my question with your sermon. Your sermon was the answer. You, you, you prepared, you know, it, it, leave it to me to answer, answer, ask a question that the whole point of you making the sermon was to answer that question that it's always been the kingdom. Mom, if you just come up here, we just, I, I, it's not in plan, but I do wanna take a second and just pray for you and dad, uh, that God's favor would continue to be on your life and that I believe that the best things that you guys have done, and that's really hard, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine with 37 years of great ministry, but mom, your book is about to come out. You're gonna turn this into a book or I will be so upset. This is, this is an incredible book. Uh, could you stretch out your hands toward them? And Father, we just thank you for mom and dad as the founders of City of Life Church. We thank you for their story. God, thank you that you took people that were willing to be used, God, and with that kingdom message, Lord, making them know deep in their heart that they're a part of something that's so transcendent, they can always be drawn to yes, a higher God. level, that they kept their hearts yes, right, they kept their eyes focused on you and fixed on you. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness that they've shown the last 37 years. And in Jesus' name, as we just lay our hand on them, we speak your presence over them. Let there be healing over every part of their life. Continue to pour wisdom, Lord, and encouragement into their spirit, Lord, so that they can continue to be a light to others. We pray that your greatest anointing and the greatest things in their life is still to come, God, and we speak that favor over them today. And we thank you for them. We love them so much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 One more hand from, from mom and dad, Pastor Justin. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.